Hi, I'm Wayne Nunez. And I'm Lori Wong Nunez. Welcome to Showcase Hawaii, Hawaii's home shopping show. We have a great show for you today. This is the third show in a five-part series that we're doing for the Creative Industries Division of Hawaii. Now that's the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism, and they're sponsoring these special segments to help our Hawaii artists out there get to the next level. Now this particular show will be covering the visual arts. So anything that involves photography, sculpture, mixed media, painting, if you are interested in any of those areas, this is the show to watch. We're excited to bring you Rick Mills. He's a glass and mixed media sculptor, chairman of the glass program at the University of Hawaii and a UH professor. Now, Rick has glass sculptures and pieces that can be found in numerous private and public collections throughout the world. So sit back, relax, and make sure you have a pen and paper ready because we have a lot of information out there for you and you're gonna wanna write it down. This segment of Showcase Hawaii is presented and co-sponsored by the Creative Industries Division of the State of Hawaii. Some of the most attractive things about glass are how immediately beautiful it is. It's innate beauty because of its transparency, its invisibility. If you watch how somebody approaches glass, they walk up to it and behave almost like a child and they want to touch it to kind of identify that it's there. How heavy is it? Is it hard? Is it soft? Can I move through it? Does it actually exist or not? And that doesn't happen with other materials. So sometimes the greatest attraction is this greatest failure though too. So I thought trying to work against that grain might be interesting. A piece called Struck by Blindness. It was this larger than life size cast head cast in glass uh, that didn't look anything like glass. And that was part of my fascination was trying to push the media into uh, something that was unexpected, it looked much more like fossilized stone or quarried rock than it did uh, prismatic cut beautiful quartz crystal. My first uh, commission was through Janice Bure and it was $5,000 and that was a lot of money. And it got me an awful lot further. It was for the Tosei International Commerce Center, which the building sold about eight or 10 years ago. It's on the corner of Kiyomoko Street and uh, Ala Moana, right in front of Ala Moana Shopping Center. So that got my toe in the door. I created a bunch of pieces that were cast bowls. It's called Echo. It's a cast crater bowl that's cast flat, machine polished, and then slumped into a vessel form. Way too big to be a bowl in anybody's private house, really. But uh, I always knew if I could convince somebody at the state that that technique of casting a flat shape and slumping it could be turned and placed on a wall that I could get into a niche somewhere. So then came the convention center, which is a glass wall called Reef Map. It's 10 foot tall, 26 feet long, and is made out of 16,000 pounds of recycled glass, window glass that would normally go into our landfills here. There is no recycling really for window glass. So it was a chance to get on the wall, basically, off, off the pedestal on the wall into a building. And so far there's been three or four of those, and I'm trying to get off the wall and trying to get to a freestanding floor. So the Manoa Public Library, the new library back in Manoa that was just finished and rebuilt, I was commissioned for by the State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, Art and Public Places program, APP, to have a freestanding piece on their mezzanine. You can't see the other side of it, but it's a freestanding series of five mountains. So I'm off the wall, on the floor, <laughs> freestanding, but you can't see the other side, so I'm a little bit closer. So ultimately, I would like to do something freestanding that you could actually walk all the way around and see it as a freestanding sculpture, basically, is where I'm headed. You're gonna do a lot of different things as an artist. You're gonna wear a lot of different hats, and that's the price of the freedom to make original artwork. You're not only the designer, the maker, the creator, but you're also the business person the professional that's going to market your work and you're also going to have to have it documented. You, you can't uh, possibly do a really, really good job at all those things. If you can focus on you know, being the best creator, the best maker you can, uh, and hiring out the other parts, especially the photography, uh, you can't really stress how important the portfolio is, even more so today, I think, because everything is online, because Everybody has a website. If you don't have a website, you don't exist. If you're not on somebody else's website, then at least get your own website. And 
If you're a maker, you can use that and barter. You can trade for things that you need, especially if you're a glass maker. You'll be able to blow cups or goblets, make paperweights, and other people want that stuff, and you can, you can trade for it in a good way. It's a commodity you have as a skill, a talent, and use that to get what you need, which is a good portfolio that is really your walking papers. The, the degree is worth one thing, but more than that piece of paper is your portfolio, and it has to, it has to pop. When your images come up on the screen, especially if you're a glass maker, the audience has to go, <gasps> it has to be breathtaking. And I'm not a good enough photographer to do that. I don't have the equipment and I don't have the time. And nowadays my time actually is probably more valuable than it is to learn how to become a really good photographer. My time is better spent doing other things, making work. You need a network. And there's a lot of ways out there now with uh, MySpace and Facebook. You have to participate. You have to try to get in every show that you possibly can and not be discouraged by being rejected. You're always going to be rejected more than you're accepted. Uh, and if you're not, well, <laughs> call me, please, and let me know about that. You know? uh, and I would worry if you're getting accepted to everything that maybe your work's a little too commercial or maybe you're too much in this time that. It's kind of nice to be a little bit ahead of things and maybe not get immediate acceptance and to learn to work hard to get what you want and maybe you'll appreciate it a little bit more when you do get it. I'll talk to a student about how to make a particular piece and probably spend longer explaining how to do it than they'll actually spend doing it. And they'll come back to work, you know, that didn't work out, I'm gonna do something else. And I'll say, well, why? Well, I tried it, you know, it didn't work out. I said, well, how many times did you try it? Well, just once, and then I gave up halfway through. I said, well, you may have to try this several times. And uh, one thing about glass blowing, glass making, is anybody that's proficient at doing anything, whether it's glass or not, will make it look easy. And then, you know, put yourself in that situation. There's a lot of physical activity, ergonomics, timing, preparation, where actually glass likes to be worked, molten glass, quite quickly. The, slower you work, the colder you work, the more forced the forms are, the more clunky things come out. Uh, but unfortunately, to be able to blow glass when it's very hot takes a lot of technical control, timing, and practice. And then shapes are created very quickly, maybe five or ten minutes. So a student will say, well, how long did it take you to, to make that piece? And it's like five, five minutes and ten years to get to that point. And, uh, so I don't know, I think students learn an awful lot about themselves when they come into a studio area, whether it be glass or sculpture, they learn an awful lot about not only the media, but how they relate to the media, what their, what their connection is to it, how it feels when you work it, what it smells like, what it looks like when it's done. And you're gonna get dirty and it's not like acquiring a new app where you can sit in your armchair and drag and drop it into your portfolio. And I think more and more, I think this generation that's coming up now is is used to the internet, they're used to social media, they're used to instantaneous gratification. And I think sometimes they're, they're not very patient, you know, and I think if you're gonna be a glass artist, it, you're gonna do an awful lot of things that never see the light of day, first of all, and you're gonna spend an awful lot of time uh, learning how to get technical control over the media, and then how to get rid of technical control. It's almost like you have to lose it at a certain point to appreciate what you can do with it. A good way of getting your work out there is to donate it. If somebody will take your work into a museum collection, by all means donate it, because it's probably going to have a lot longer life in someone's collection than it will sitting in your backyard or in the closet somewhere getting trampled on. Um, so I don't know, once I have a photograph of something, I, I do try to get it out there as much as possible, enter competitions, enter exhibitions to try to get the work around as much as possible. There's websites like Zapp, Z-A-P-P dot com, I think it is, and Weststaff has one too that list all the monthly current art competitions across the, the country uh, and the region, and they go from the, the simplest arts and crafts sale to the top competitions for public federal works of art. There's a few things I can guarantee you, but this is only one of them, that unless you enter, you don't have a chance getting accepted. You have to get used to rejection, and I think you have to get used to acceptance, too, and accept them with an equal grain of salt, because it's really easy, I think, to get self-aggrandized by getting into something, and hey, all your friends may not be real happy for you. The friends that you thought were your friends may not be real happy to see you get ahead, and that's a pretty rude awakening, really, when that happens. But, 
I don't think there was any incident in my life where all of a sudden I made it, and I don't think I've made it yet. I feel very fortunate to be where I am, but I think I have a long ways to go. And I am careful how I define success, and I advise students to be careful how they define success, and be careful in the work that they make, because that work will create you. And if you're making very dark work, uh, you become very dark. And you know, not everybody wants to buy that work. And choosing a venue that is appropriate means you also have to do your homework. You have to scout these galleries, these museums. And unfortunately, Hawaii is a much more commercial market. There isn't a, a gallery system like you'd find in most metropolitan cities like New York or San Francisco that has a, a gallery system that uh, entrains a group of artists that they show regularly every year or two. And you're not guaranteed sales, but that gallery director has taste. They have acumen. They have intelligence, they're sophisticated, usually the good ones, and they have a clientele. So when a gallery director shows an interest in your work, they're already, already thinking about who may want it for their collection. And you want someone like that on your side, and you have to get into those kind of galleries, which are really tough to do nowadays. A lot of galleries have closed. The ones that are successful, a lot of times, are not taking new artists, so try to get into um, a summer exhibition when they're taking new up-and-coming artists. You need to prove to a gallery that you're mobile, that you're not stuck out here on an island making island art. They have very preconceived ideas of island artists, and you need to get your, you and your artwork out there. Uh, you usually can't walk up to a gallery director and hand your portfolio over to the director and say, hey, will you look at my work? The last time I tried to do that, the associate director says, if I look at your portfolio, I'll lose my job. Here, let me put it on that pile across the room. Three piles, about waist high. I'll get back to you. But you do need to prove that you're available and that you're there. And so spend that money on that ticket. Uh, fly around, try to get an interview. Uh, send out a sample set of your images or direct them to your website. Uh, and tell the gallery director you're going to be passing through. You would like to have an interview. Don't show them all your stuff. Show them some of your better stuff. But show, have something in reserve. You can have something else to show them, and if you show them 20 pieces and none of it's available, then um, what interest is that to a gallery director? You have to have available work. Everything can't be photographed, cannibalized, destroyed. You have to have work out that's available, and it has to be reasonable, priced. And you're going to double the price at least, probably sometimes more than double it, and you can only expect to get maybe your 50%. In some places, it's 70-30, 70, 70 to the gallery, 30 to the artist. But once you get that show, probably a small group show with three or four other artists in similar positions or fresh out of school or just trying to get a toe in the door, that will introduce you. And you, you want to get that first introduction wherever it may be, San Francisco, Seattle, New York, uh, or Hawaii, Honolulu. And here's some other resources for the visual arts. And here's some business resources to help you become Hawaii's next great artist. So many of you may be wondering, at what point do I seek out the advice of an attorney? Do I have to wait until I'm discovered or somebody wants to buy my work or commission me to do some work? Now, if you're an artist that has incredible designs and you want to protect those designs, this next guest will tell you how to do that. Martin Shaw is a patent attorney. He's one of the few in Hawaii, and he practices copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, and he can tell you that it's never too early to seek out an attorney. And you know the great thing about Martin, he was voted one of the best lawyers in America for the past 20 years. The very first thing that someone should do when they create something of the visual arts is register the copyright rights. And the reason is if you don't register the copyright rights, when someone rips you off, then you won't be able to sue them in court and you will have to prove your actual damages 
and you cannot collect attorney's fees. But if you registered the copyright rights before someone infringes, you can sue in court and you don't need to prove the damages. You can just ask the court to set the amount of damages. If an artist came to me and said, I want to protect this artwork because this hotel or this large company wants to be able to use this artwork and maybe put it in a museum or maybe put it on souvenir merchandise or calendars, then the first thing I would tell the artist is, okay, you have to register the copyright rights. It's pretty cheap. I would say it's easy because you can do it online. The problem is I've never seen someone do a copyright registration correctly when they've tried to do it themselves. Even any attorneys don't do it correctly. There's some very specialized areas that you have to deal with when you're dealing with copyright rights, especially, for example, collections of photographs. And there are different rules. It's $45 per registration. But if you have an unpublished collection where all of the works are unpublished and they're all by the same author, then you can register all of those works all at once in a single application. So once you have those issues cleared up, then you also need to know that the ownership of the copyright rights is correct because was this work created when you were an employee of somebody else? That's a very interesting question that we need to know about. Is there some kind of a contract by which you've agreed that uh, you will transfer the copyright rights to somebody else? So those are issues that have to be explored as well. Once we have those questions answered, then we can go ahead and register the copyright rights to that one work. But there may be other works that the artist also wants to register. At $45 a pop, you want to think about, well, can I register a bunch of works as an unpublished collection? That would require that each of those works have the same author and none of them can be published. Then, when you want to exploit the photographs, you make sure that whoever is going to be using it is under a contractual obligation that they have to put a copyright notice on saying your uh, C with a circle, the year of first publication, and your name and make sure that that copyright notice is on there so that people will recognize that it is under copyright protection and they cannot claim that they're an innocent infringer. And then you may want to require that and forbid them from putting it on the internet. You may want to make sure, for example, that when you send the photographs off that they're not in high resolution, that they are in low resolution until you've got a signed contract and then you deliver the high resolution but you say that this high resolution cannot be emailed or otherwise transmitted, cannot be posted on the internet and make sure that you have embedded in the photograph copyright notice as well. And then you would just go ahead and read the contracts that the artist is being asked to sign and see whether the artist's rights are being adequately protected in the exploitation. For example, are you going to limit the number of copies that can be made to a particular number? Are you going to limit the license only to a particular time period? Some of the most recent copyright cases have been against publishers where there were licenses issued for a specific number of usages and then the publisher exceeded the number of usages. Most creative people do not really have to focus on the business side because they're focusing so much on the creativity, but then the business side will come back and bite you. And it's not just creative people. Most people don't really deal with the business side because, frankly, most people are just trying to make a living. Doesn't that make you want to just get up there and start painting and, and register that awesome <laughs> painting that you have? Now, we, as we said earlier, this show is dedicated to the visual arts and it's Showcase Hawaii, so we have to offer something on the show. It's our duty, right? Well, I was going to say, it also makes me want to go out and see a lot of artwork, well, and what better place yes. than the Hawaii State Art Museum. Exactly. Not only can you see pieces that Rick has in here, but we yes. have at the Hawaii State Art Museum some of the best artwork in Hawaii, and, and it's free. A lot of people don't know about it. Now exactly. this is the largest collection of art by Hawaii artists. So you really want to take the time to come down and see it. And like Wayne said, it's free. So the incredible part is that you've got this entire collection that you can see at your disposal, but you can also take home something to remind you of all the artwork that you see. We've got a very special collection being featured right now and it's called the Hague Collection. It took 30 years to create this collection of paintings, prints, and traditional arts of Hawaii. It really represents some priceless works of history. And we have such rare traditional arts, like we mentioned, the featherwork, ni'ihau shells, calabashes, and quilts. The collection includes Walden, Howard Hitchcock, Madge Tennant, and extremely 
rare traditional forms of art, which you can go up to these pieces, walk around them, and actually get a very close-up look of each piece. 100% of the proceeds will go to the nonprofit Friends of the Hawaii State Art Museum, which is the foundation that supports the Hawaii State Art Museum. So not only are you getting a beautiful gift for yourself and for your friends and family, and especially if you know anyone who's on the mainland or living abroad, they would love to see this collection if they're not gonna make it in person. Now it's very rare for anyone to donate back to the Hawaii State Art Museum and the Art and Public Places collection because this was a private collection. So right. most of the times when estates are transferred, you know, it stays within the family or it's sold off. The interesting thing about this collection is that Joan Damon Haig, when she passed away in 2004, she wanted the public to enjoy the paintings, the artwork as much as she did. So she had the whole collection donated to the Hawaii State Art Museum so that everybody can enjoy it, which is really great. It's so nice. In the Hawaiian language, hei makana means a gift. And the title refers to this distinguished collection, which, as we said, was a gift presented to the Hawaii State Art Museum in honor of Gertrude Mary Joan Damon Haig. So it's something that you really want to make sure that you see before it leaves the museum. We're not sure how long the collection will be staying there. We're just so fortunate to have it. And you can't believe we had an entire list of people that we had to call back and say, we now have this catalog and that you can actually have it. So we've had people coming in buying 10 at a time. And I have to tell you, there are only limited quantities and it won't be reprinted. Now, I think you'll be really surprised, pleasantly, pleased when you see it in person and if you don't get that opportunity at least you would have this book to reference but the artwork is amazing and so many rare items that you would never expect to see and where Wayne and I are just always commenting about how did they collect all these items it was over a 30-year period but it's mm -hmm. amazing that it's a private collection I cannot tell you how surprised and happy people were when I called them and said, we actually got this catalog and you can come down and buy it. So we were getting reservations, please put it on hold. And it's just been really nice being able to share this. And I think it was nice for the family to know that this donation meant so much and is really uh, spreading the art, the love of art and the beauty of art throughout Hawaii and beyond. Now, if you've never been to the White State Art Museum, you have to visit. There's parking all around downtown, underneath the Capitol, Ali'i plays along Richards, and you have to come in because this collection will only be at the Hawaii State Art Museum for a limited time. Now, it's in the Diamond Head Wing, so if you've never been to the museum, you wanna go up to the stairs. There's also elevator access, and then as soon as you get through the doors, and take a look around at the architecture too. Well, people will come in and say, I love the floors, I love the ceilings, I love the lights, and it's such a beautiful landmark building, and it is in a landmark district. It's the Capital One District building, and it was also the home, uh, former headquarters of developer Chris Hemeter, so a lot of people still refer to it as the Hemeter building. Or the YMCA, they right. refer to it as the YMCA. Right. And if you look in the back in the sculpture garden, there was a swimming pool back there that they turned into this giant piece of sculpture and you have to go out there and walk on it, it's amazing. But the best part of the Hawaii State Art Museum is the Showcase Hawaii gift shop. Right, don't forget <laughs> to stop in. So if you, if you are on Oahu and you're anywhere near downtown Honolulu, come visit us at Showcase Hawaii. We're at the lobby level of the Hawaii State Art Museum. We do have these catalogs there for sale. They're amazing catalogs there's a limited number and if you want to take a peek at the collection and get a catalog afterwards we do have them in the shop another great show and i hope you visit us at the hawaii state art museum yeah and i hope you found the information helpful and that it will give you the confidence to take that step forward and get your work out there and 
get some feedback from people and don't forget to protect your work too. Yeah, create that art and protect it. That's the main, if you learned anything, protect that artwork that you have. Now don't forget, if you want to order the Haig Collection catalog, then just log on. The ordering process is so fast and it's so easy. Just go to www.showcasehawaii.tv. Thanks for watching.